The following program is an MLWRadio.com production. NMLS number 65084, Equal Housing Lenders. Woo! Today's episode of What Happened When Monday with Tony Schiavone is brought to you by BrandNewHouse.com. Of course, we've been telling you for the last few weeks about how you can get your very own brand new house with as little as just $500 down. And the great thing about a brand new house is not only is it new, it's custom to you. So you get to pick where it is and what it looks like from the color of the brick to the flooring, the countertops, the kitchen cabinets, the door handles, the paint, whatever. It's all your choice at brandnewhouse.com. You can also own your very own brand new house for roughly what you're paying in rent right now. And again, you don't need a down payment. You might not need a down payment at all, but many families can get a brand new house for only $500 down at brandnewhouse.com. The best part though, is everything is brand new. So there's no repairs and your new home comes with a warranty. And no matter your budget, you can own a brand new house at brandnewhouse.com. So what are you waiting for? Go to brandnewhouse.com right now. Welcome to WHW Monday. Tony Schiavone and Conrad Thompson. Jim Crockett for Starcade, 605 NWA, TV title, Cajun Omni, the Bunkhouse Stampede, Flair and Horseman, Garvin, Bogey, Magnum, Dusty, Express Tag Team, Turner, Bond, and Mid-South Joy World Championship Wrestling. Talking about the great years of World Championship Wrestling, the NWA and Jim Crockett Promotion. Tony and Friends North, they win, look, Shivani's back again, World Title Split Off, Center Stage, Bischoff, Disney, Hogan, and Nitro, New World Order, and the Crow. Under Russo, Arcat Champ, Vinny Mac, Simulcast. Tony's back with Conrad, not your classy podcast. Watch a long try not to laugh, lowest rules, cat back. This wasn't the initial plan, Tom Ziggs a good looking man. Klondike Bill, make a tip. Tommy, you come over here. What happened when? WHW Monday. And now, let's go to the ring. And here's your co-host, Hey Hey. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to What Happened When Monday on the MLW Radio Network. And of course, it wouldn't be What Happened When without the Master of Ceremonies, Tony Schiavone. How are you, kind sir? Uh, Fine, kind sir. It's good to be talking to you once again. Hello out there, slapdicks across the world. I would say slapdicks of America, but I know, I know we have a lot listening to us from Australia, from New Zealand. We have some people in Germany, a lot of people in the UK, Belgium, reaching out to us, listening to us uh, all across the world. Yes, if you listen to this program, you are slapdick, and I say that with so much affection. It's great to be with you. Conrad, I hope you had a good week as well, and uh, we've been having a lot of fun doing this podcast. We have indeed, and we had a lot of fun last week with Wrestle War 1991. I recorded it on location in Las Vegas. We had just done the live show with Bruce Pritchard the night before. So it sounded different because we didn't have our usual rigs. We're back in business this week and uh, we're going to try to be on time with you every single week. So some weeks it'll sound a little different. Sorry about that, but we're committed to giving you a great show or as good as we can do every week. But I thought we did pretty well last week, Tony. What was your feedback from wrestle war 1991? Uh, well, my feedback was a Conrad, uh, overwhelmingly that God, Tony Schiavone remembered stuff uh, and uh, really jogged his memory. Uh, and, and what jogged your memory? Uh, one uh, follower on Twitter said, what the fuck happened to your memory? You remember things. And I said, it's a combination of Prevagen and alcohol uh, vodka. And uh, of course that was tongue in cheek, but you know, I, I'll say this, uh, the more I watch and the more I watch stuff, uh, you know, watching the old stuff on the network, uh, watching, you know, M and doing MLW, uh, stuff. And, uh, and, uh, I, I just, uh, it, j- it just jogs the memory. It absolutely jogs the memory. I'm so happy to be back in the wrestling business. And I credit you with that Conrad bringing me back, getting me started back in the wrestling business. Uh, and I've just enjoyed every bit of it. I- I've enjoyed uh, watching the old stuff on the, the WWE network. Uh, I've enjoyed, uh, you know, uh, being uh, connected with court and, uh, MLW. Uh, I, I, and I, I even watched the, the new shit, uh, the new stuff, uh, that's out there now, uh, in the WWE. So, uh, I've, uh, thank you very much. I've enjoyed it, but my memory's back a little story. 
Uh, I don't know if I've been on the uh, his podcast yet, but I recorded an, uh, an episode of Talk is Jericho with our buddy Chris Jericho. He came to Atlanta, and we sat down for about an hour and a half, two hours, and recorded his uh, podcast, and it was great seeing him. And we were talking about remembering the stuff that happened in the past. And he's like, man, and Chris is much younger than me. He's still in his 40s. And uh, Chris said, well, you know, you, we did so much stuff day in and day out. It's really hard to remember everything you did. And I said, yeah, I know. So I'm not the only one that doesn't remember everything. But last week I apparently did, and that's the biggest feedback I got. Well, and I want to encourage everybody, if you haven't already, to go follow us on Twitter. It's at WHW Monday, and it's worth it really just so you can see last week's show graphic. Uh, depending on what listening device you use to hear our show, you may not have seen the Wrestle War 1991 graphic, but I think it's maybe Dave Silva's best work ever. He had uh, a takeoff on a war movie, and you'll recognize it when you see it. You see a silhouette of Ric Flair. You see Arn Anderson. You see Tony Schiavone, myself, and Dusty Rhodes. Is this Dave Silva's best cover art ever, Tony? Yeah, I would agree it is. Absolutely. You know, Dave has done some great silly, silly ass stuff before, but this was right on target. And we appreciate all the work that Dave's done. I don't know that we give enough love on this show for the folks who help us sort of behind the scenes, but since we are on our farewell tour as we march towards your daughter's wedding, which happens in just a few short weeks. We should yeah. thank some of the people who've helped make the show possible. Uh, Dave Silva at DG Silva 1975 on Twitter has done all of our hilarious graphics. Any funny video work you've ever seen for Tony and I has always been done by Chris McDonald, KDog96 on Twitter. And of course, lazy ass Matt Coon. But I feel like you should probably talk a little bit about at Matt Coon music because he is one of your favorite talking points here on the show. Yeah, Matt Coon is a multi talented guy. He runs a music school in, in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, and it, it amazes me that uh, parents would send their kids uh, to Matt to learn music because I'm sure Matt doesn't get off the chair to even uh, welcome the parents into the house. I've never seen Matt Coon stand before. I've only seen his fat ass sit down in a chair or lay down on the couch. So, uh, uh, But he is a talented guy. We appreciate everything that Matt Coon has done. I need to ask you, Dave Silva, D. Silva, 1975, was, was that his birth year or would that be his weight? That's a great I'm, call. I'm, I'm going to think probably the birth year. I think he's a handful of years older than me, so it makes sense to me that he'd be born in 75. All right. All right. Uh, and Matt Kuhn, uh's Twitter handle should be, won't get up for shit. Uh, that should be his Twitter handle, but it's not. If, if there's not a parody account for at lazy ass Matt Coon by noon today, then our listeners have let us down. Uh, I feel like I should also put over that we've got a YouTube channel. Of course we know. I mean, I guess the cat's out of the bag. Your daughter is getting <laughs> married in like three weeks. So we've got a handful of shows left here on the show. Once the wedding's paid for as promised, we're fucking out of here, but you'll be able to refer all your friends and family to check out the archives on YouTube. We wanted to go ahead and get a YouTube channel going. Uh, once it's been up and active for about a month, we can get a redirect. But we're going to go ahead and forward a silly-ass domain over there now. So probably by the time you hear this, you can go check out TomZinc.com. And at TomZinc.com, uh, you'll be able to uh, refer your friends to the phenomenal archives of the great show that was WHW Monday. Um, so tell your friends, boys and girls, let's let the legend live on and let's keep it going this week with uncensored 1997 to my surprise, this won the poll this week. And I've got to tell you, Tony, normally I'm a big fan of the polls, but I was really hoping that uncensored 2000 would have won because uncensored 97 is just a damn great show. But let's talk about what was on uncensored 2000 that we won't be covering. This of course happens when WCW is in a steep decline, it yep. went down in Florida, 5,000 folks were there. And the card is most famous, at least in my opinion, for the main event that had Hulk Hogan and Ric Flair in a Yappa Pie Indian strap match. <laughs> Tony, what the fuck is a Yappa Pie Indian strap match? I don't know. I've yapped up a lot of pies in my life. I, and I don't know what the, a lot of pumpkin pies, as a matter of fact, coconut cream. But I don't know what a yappa pie Indian match is, <laughs> with the exception of this had to be just 
one of those crazy ideas from uh, Vince Russo, right? I mean, <laughs> yep, bye. Maybe you strap match up your ass. That's the only thing I can think of. It was that politically. Yeah, it's fine. Who gives a fuck? Uh, we're out of here in a couple more shows anyway. Hey, so that same show had Terry Funk bring out a chicken when he took on Dustin Rhodes. And you know, Terry Funk and a chicken wrestling a ro- This is just, yeah. oh, well, we won't get it. Instead, we're going to cover Uncensored 1997. And we're going to do something, you know, a lot of people have been asking lately because so many of our shows uh, in the last six months or so have been watch along. Maybe not that long, but the first real dedicated watch along that I thought was just awesome was the August 1997 Nitro. And of course, lots of people say, I don't like the watch alongs. And I, I'm, I'm receptive to that. I appreciate the feedback. But without us doing watch along there, we may have never actually covered Tommy Young, which has gone on to be one of the biggest bits on the show. And then, of course, Halloween Havoc 95, I think most people would say, is probably our funniest show ever. Um, but not all shows are really as fun because there's not as much silliness. And this Uncensored 97 show, there's a lot of great shit on here, Tony. Yeah, Conrad, it's, it's good for us to do watch-alongs with a shitty pay-per-view or a shitty show. It's really good to do that because it kind of like is kind of like Mystery Science Theater 3000. They take right. they take the bad movies and then they do an alternate alternate commentary to it or watch along. This was a good show. It was a great show, I think. And I I I also want I want fans to go back to the network again when you have the time and watch the show. Now Triple H Vince won't charge you for this to promote this on uh, what happened when uh, but go back on the network and watch this show because you are going to hear some of the funniest commentary ever by Dusty Rhodes and Bobby the Brain Heenan. I, I literally, during the uh, Texas Tornado uh, match, uh, laughed until I got sick listening to Dusty and, and Heenan go back and forth. Uh, listen for the Rick Shaw comments, for the Bag of Cement comments, and... <laughs> Listen to what happened when uh, Public Enemy uh, was going at it against Harlem Heat. Uh, just, I'm, I'm telling you, those two were in rare form that day. It's worth listening to without listening to us talk over it. 1997, and we've talked about this a lot on the show, is my absolute favorite year in the history of wrestling. I was at the height of my wrestling fandom. It was such a great time to be a fan. You're in the middle of the Monday Night Wars. If you don't like what's on one channel, change it to the other. There's always something you would dig. And you're talking to your friends who are watching the other show. And, oh, man, did you see what happened? You got to switch the channel. This is a great time to be a wrestling fan. And this show we're covering today, I think a lot of people sort of lose sight of the timing here. This is March of 1997. So wrestling companies at this time are very much competing for your pay-per-view dollar. About a month after this, we get barely legal ECW's very first pay-per-view that was available here in the United States. They'd always just been a tape trading company prior to that. And of course they had some syndicated cable shows, but this is going to be ECW's foray into pay-per-view. So with WCW knowing that's coming in this very same month, their biggest rival, the WWF is presenting WrestleMania, obviously historically the biggest show of the year. So WCW wants to pull out all the stops here. So maybe in years prior, you hear uncensored and you're like, eh, but here they're at the height of the NWO. Crow sting is, is kicking. You've got the luchadors. Nitro is full speed ahead. This is a big opportunity for them to make a big splash on pay-per-view. And I feel like that's what they did here with uncensored 97. They pulled out all the stops and uh, we're going to talk about that today, but today it's not a watch along. So uh, if you were hoping for that, we might have some fun little asides for you later this week on Facebook. Uh, I think our man, Chris McDonald can probably, uh, put together some video with some of the hilarious commentary on a couple of funny parts. And if you watch this show this week, you know what we're talking about, but by and large, I'd like to cover this one more legitimately. It goes down on March 16th, 1997. So about 21 years ago. And they're at the North Charleston Coliseum in North Charleston, South Carolina. They drew 9,295 fans. 
And uh, of that, 7640 paid $101,184. There were only about 360 tickets shy of a sellout. And it's in South Carolina, uh, North Charleston, South Carolina. So it's not like they're running a Chicago. Are you pleased with this gate at this point? Obviously, this is, it feels like WCW could draw in bigger buildings and bigger markets, but maybe this was booked before the NWO really caught fire and WCW knew what they had. Well, that was one of the things, but also we were dead set on, and Gary Juster was book, it was basically booking buildings back then. And, uh, you know, I, I know Gary very, very well. He works for Ring of Honor now. Uh, we basically wanted this. We wanted a building that we know would look good and would sound good on TV and would give the response that we wanted. Charleston, South Carolina, uh, not only the birthplace of Darius Rucker, but Charleston, South Carolina was a stronghold of the forerunner, Jim Crockett Promotions. Never, ever in the history, if I can use that term over and over again, of Jim Crockett Promotions did we ever draw 100,000 plus in Charleston, South Carolina. This was a big deal. And the fans, we knew the fans would be good. So, yeah, probably on the marquee to say that Uncensored was coming to you from Philadelphia or Boston or somewhere like that. Uh, saying it come, comes from Charleston is a downer because, you know, look, I, I've talked about this before. Eric hated the Southern connotation that was WCW. He wanted to wipe that out. Hated it. But... uh he also knew that we could draw a pretty good house in the South. Uh, so uh, this was one, there's many reasons. Uh, and also, you know, we weren't, uh, we were just getting real, real hot right now. So I'm not so sure there were a lot of buildings still open to us at this time. Again, I've talked about this, Conrad, and you know this, uh, the war, there's a, there was a war, the wrestling war that was going on on uh during the Monday night wars was a war on TV, but there was also another front line of the war. And that was guys booking buildings. And it was not always easy to get into the buildings that you wanted to get into. I feel like we should uh, sort of set the stage with some behind the scenes news as we head here. Uh, and this was straight from the dirt sheets. Disco Inferno was fired on March 4th when he ref refused to do a program, which would have ended with him putting over Jacqueline in a singles match at uncensored. The vast majority of the wrestlers were totally in support of Disco on that one and felt that putting over a woman in a singles match was a career killer. What can you tell us about this, Tony? Well, it would have, I don't know if it would have been a career killer or not. It's, look, it's, it's, uh, my opinion is, well, of course, my opinion is you do what's asked of you. I understand that. Uh, I'm not so sure it would have been a career killer, but I, I knew how Glenn was and he was adamant about this. And I know how the boys were. You know, they were adamant about this as well. Boy, I mean, think about how things have changed now. I mean, they have mixed tag team matches going on now in the WWE. So uh, uh, women's wrestling has come a long, long way. Uh, I don't know if I supported him or not. Uh, that This was the uh, focus of Gene Okerlund's hotline uh, uh, tease all through the course of the show. But, uh, you know, the fact is that he did not want to do it, and he would later do it, right? Yeah, um, and we've covered it here on the show. He did it at Halloween Havoc in this same year. So we're in March, and he's not doing it, and he's fired, supposedly, yeah. allegedly. Right. But he's come October and doing it for Jacqueline there. Right, yeah. So, it, you know, I, I guess once you get fired and once you kind of uh, rethink your your situation in life, uh, maybe you decide to, to yourself that uh, this is the best thing to do. Go back now, later in the year, and we've covered that match with he and Jacqueline. It was not a good match. It was a difficult match for him to do. Uh, so maybe, in effect, he was right. But if it's going to mean losing your job, what the hell? I feel like we should talk a little bit about um, what's all over the dirt sheets at the time. And I know you're not usually comfortable with this, but I'm just going to read it straight from the dirt sheets. March 3rd, St. Paul Pioneer Press ran an update about the situation involving Hulk Hogan's lawsuit and countersuit involving an alleged sexual encounter after the first Nitro on September 4th, 1995. The woman involved, Kate Kennedy, claims she helped Hulk Hogan sell his merchandise at the Nitro at the Mall of America, and then she delivered merchandise to his hotel room, where Hogan forced her to have oral sex with him. 
Hogan claimed the story was false. And as a preemptive strike against the lawsuit, he served, he sued her for extortion. Kennedy's attorneys are now filing a countersuit against Terry Balea. In the suit, Kennedy says she arrived at Hogan's room after midnight to deliver merchandise. At which point, Hogan lifted her off the floor and carried her to his bed, where he forced her to perform oral sex. Hogan has two movies upcoming, one called Hardball. Yikes. And another called The Ultimate Weapon. Yikes. Really? Which will be filmed this summer in Montreal. So that's straight from the Wrestling Observer Newsletter. Uh, we've talked about this a little bit during our first Nitro episode, but here we see the chickens come to roost, as they say, or whatever that cliche is. What do you remember about this story that maybe Hulk's thermos had got him in a little trouble? Yeah, well, you know, it was uh, pretty well known that this was going on, but it, it was Hulk Hogan, and he was very important to what we were doing. So uh, wrong or, or right, we just kind of just, not laughed it off, but ignored it. Uh, and uh, I, I know he he presented a pretty good front, but I think we all knew that this was something that w- was weighing heavy on him. Uh, but he was pretty cool about it. You know, it's not like you would go in the backstage area, Conrad, and you would say, hey, Hulk, how's that suit coming? Did you really force that girl to have oral sex with you? You don't say things like that. Uh, but so uh, it was, uh, it, he was, okay. I don't think it affected his work. Put it that way. Now, the dirt sheets would say, well, he can't work anyway. So what the fuck? But I don't think it affected what he was doing for us at all. Yeah, it's um, it's a weird deal because there's so much, you know, that's happened in the last year in real life with Time's Up and Me Too and all this other stuff that these accusations from back in the day were certainly handled differently. And what you were able to or not able to do in public after certainly changed as well because there's a promo inside of uncensored where the NWO specifically hall Nash Savage and Hogan are standing around sort of making comments, some innuendos, if you will, about Kimberly page and knowing that this is sort of going on behind the scenes, you would never do that today. Right, Tony? No, no, not at all. You would never do what they did in that uh, promo with diamond Dallas page later on. Uh, you would never do it. You know, that was, that was typical. I thought that you go back and you look at that promo that they all did. I thought it was terrible promo. It was just kind of a rambling on promo. Didn't know where to end. Uh, and, uh, actually didn't know where to start. They were just kind of being cool and they were ragging on a lot of things. Uh, just you're, you're right. It's just, uh, this day and age, it would not fly in the business or in the world. Arn Anderson um, is expected to be out around this time for about four months and may have to undergo surgery to fuse three vertebrae in his neck per Dave Meltzer and the wrestling observer. He writes the neck injury, which is apparently a flaring up of an injury seven years ago caused in a match against the Steiners has caused his hand to go numb. Do you remember having conversations with Arn about when the original injury happened? Of course, we know we're going to see him actually offer up his spot and retire in September of this year. But that hasn't happened at this point. We're still in March. When do you remember it becoming very evident that this is it? Well, I remember it becoming uh, very evident. This is it long before that. I it, look it, uh, you take a pounding, uh, and you take a pounding, you do a lot of backdrops and you land on your neck or you land on your back or you get hit in the head and you get dropped on your head and, and they try to protect you on uh, a pile driver. It's a cumulative thing. It, it, it is. And Arn Anderson w- would talk to me about, you know, having trouble with his arms and tingling uh, down the side of his arms. And, you know, I had had surgery in 1995. So I might have had surgery two years ago. And I told Arn, I said, listen, I said, that is kind of like what I had. And I said, you need to have something done about this before you get into the problems that I had. Now, here's what I had. I, and, of course, I never took a bump, but I, I, I let mine go so long that I got scar tissue on my spine. And scar tissue on your spine will not heal. It will uh, affect you the rest of your life. In other words, you will have pain the rest of your life. You may be out of the woods as far as, 
you know, uh, having all your extremities move, but you could start scar tissue on your spine. You're going to have pain all your life. Uh, he knew that. He and I talked about it. He and I had long conversations about, believe it or not, sleeping. And Arnold would say, are you like me? He said, you just can't get a good night's sleep and you toss and turn. You try to put a pillow and you just can't get comfortable. And I said, yeah. I said, you know, this is some serious stuff. So I, I know that you go back in history and, and listen to him talk that there was one point to where it happened. But this was a cumulative thing because, listen, I'm, I'm sounding like a doctor here. Everybody's spine is different. Arn Anderson probably couldn't take, could, did take the same bumps a lot of guys did, but his spine would not react to it as well as other guys did. So this was a cumulative thing that he finally would have something done about it. Somebody else uh, who was needing something done about it was obviously Kevin Nash because Meltzer would report around this same time that he started appearing in television commercials for a chiropractor in Atlanta. Uh, do you remember some of the boys having a favorite chiropractor and maybe doing some sort of trade? Hey, you take care of me and don't charge me and I'll do your spots for you. Oh yeah. That happened. The, the, the boys try to work the deals out on their own a lot. Diamond Dallas page had a chiropractor that he liked. Uh, and he, uh, uh, again, they they did a lot of trade off uh, on that. Now, as a matter of fact, I think that chiro- as a matter of fact, I'm sure of it that chiropractor and Diamond Dallas Page still know each other quite well because that chiropractor uh, lives very close to me. Um, I'm not so sure of the name, but yeah, that you know the boys always try to work out deals of their own, and uh, you, if you can get away with it, fuck, do it. That's what I think. It, it's always good to ask for forgiveness than ask for permission. Do you remember working any trades out? You know, with the announcers, did Bobby Heenan ever do something like that? Did you, Dusty, Mike, Tanae, did any of you guys ever agree and, and sort of have a conversation about, hey, look at this good idea I had in my market. Now, in exchange for blank, I'm doing so-and-so. No, and I will tell you why. Because uh, there was, how do I say this? There was a lot of, I, I thought, uh Back in the day, Gordon Soley would mention some places. I don't know if you remember that or not. Gordon would mention uh, his friend here and his friend there, his friend at Malio's or whatever. Uh, and he got a lot of heat for that. Uh, and again, the boys can get away with a lot of shit more than the announcers can. Uh, so I stayed away from all that. And to the best of my knowledge, uh, Heenan did as well. I mean, we could have talked about Hertz Renter Car or Marriott, which was what we used all the time, or some of our favorite places uh, to go and eat, but we just kind of stayed away from it. Let's talk about Clash of the Champions because it's something that I really enjoyed as a kid, and I've always wondered, hey, why did that end? But Meltzer wrote here, the August Clash of the Champions has officially been canceled because by that time, TBS will be running two-hour weekly live shows, which is almost a sure thing now on Thursday nights, heads up, with shows like Seinfeld and Friends, which is a lot harder competition than Raw. Of course, we know he's referencing Thunder, but it doesn't wind up happening by August, and that Clash of the Champions, which he says was officially canceled, actually does happen. It goes down on August 21st in Nashville, Tennessee, and it's the very last Clash of the Champions, Clash of the Champions 35. I always enjoyed the specials, but I guess I never really put it together that the reason they did away with it was the creation of Thunder. I think in hindsight, and I'm pretty sure I speak for every wrestling fan listening to this, we would have much rather you guys stuck thunder up your ass and continue to give us clash to the champions. Would you agree? Well, so would the office and so would have Eric Bischoff. I've mentioned here on this program, the meeting that Eric had with us where he said, listen, they want us to do another show for TBS because of the success of nitro. And I've told the Turner people that unless Ted Turner himself says, you're going to do it. We're not going to do it. So we did it. The, uh, the trade-off that Eric had to make with the Turner execs was, all right, let's get rid of Clash of the Champions because we cannot just keep having special shows because now you got this thunder thing and it, it can't be just your run-of-the-mill WCW Saturday night show. It's got to be a special show. So now what we got, we got Nitro special show. We got Thunder a special show. We got our pay-per-views a special show. And we're going to make another one, Clash of the Champions, a special show. You just creatively, you couldn't do it. I don't see sometimes how the uh, creative people in the WWE do what they're doing now. 
because of all the TV they've got to put together and all the things they got to do. Uh, again, Conrad, the more shit you put out there, the less shit means. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah the less it means. So that's what's going on today with the WWE. I've, I've often, you know, in, in my uh, criticism of the WWE, and I don't do that much of it because I kind of respect what the uh, creative people are doing. But in my criticism of the WWE, someone will say to me, so what do you think of the, the product out there today? What do you think of what WWE is doing? I said, well, nothing means anything. Uh, and there's no real big, with the exception of maybe Brock Lesnar, there's no big time superstar out there because everybody fights everybody on TV because everybody, they have these fatal five ways or triple threats or whatever all the time. And guys like uh, AJ Styles, the WWE champion, did a job on TV. Uh, and why did they do that? Because they got to do that because they just got a lot of TV they have to service. Now, that was the reason that Clash of the Champions went off the air because we just had too much TV. We had to service. And that's, I'm telling you, uh, you know, you can point to all the, all anything that you want to point to the decline of WCW. You can say uh, shitty storylines, uh, horrible talent. Uh, Tony Schiavone's comment about Mick Foley, say what all what you want to say, but we did not have the talent to be able to service all these TV shows. Didn't have it. And therefore, the WCW product got watered down big time. Let's go to the show. The dark match saw Ice Train get the pin over Max. Uh, the report was, it's about as good as you'd expect, according to Dave Meltzer. Hey, Tony, what's your favorite Ice Train match? Woo-woo! It was Ice Train and Kimberly from 1996. Eddie beat Diamond Dallas Page for the United States title at Starcade 96. So here we are. We've got Eddie Guerrero defending his United States title in a phenomenal opener against Dean Malenko. Uh, they go 19 minutes and 14 seconds. Dean becomes your U.S. champion, which I've got to tell you, I kind of forgot about. So kudos to Dean for getting the nod here. Here's what Dave wrote. Malenko was the clear-cut crowd favorite in this match, even though Guerrero was the storyline babyface. The match was only a minor surprise since Belenko has gotten very popular of late, while Guerrero's popularity has gone down in the past year. Fans booed the hell out of Guerrero when he would do the exact same thing Malenko was cheered for doing just seconds later. A well-constructed, very good match, although they've had better matches in the past. They tried to do a different match here with more of a grudge feel to it. While the match was going on, Rick Steiner was backstage surrounded by Kevin Nash, Scott Hall, and Six as they mockingly screamed to call for help because there was an accident. Uh, Steiner was stretchered out and taken out in an ambulance. Back to the match, Guerrero worked on Malenko's knee for several minutes, basically doing spots Malenko usually does, and then it picked up after Guerrero missed a plancha and crashed onto the guardrail. Guerrero came down with a near fall from a Cubradora, which is a spinning backbreaker, and uh, a powerbomb and a jackknife pin. In the end... It's a pretty cool finish because we've got six involved. Uh, Dave would write Malenko hit a power slam and Guerrero's frog splash, but lifted Guerrero up, refusing to pin him. He goes for another power bomb. Guerrero reverses it into a necktie head scissors. They do a German suplex for a near fall while Guerrero comes back with a swinging DDT. Guerrero then goes for Malenko's finisher, which we know is the Texas Cloverleaf. And this brings six down. So Guerrero drops the hole to start arguing with six, who's Sean Waltman, the one, two, three kid, X Pac. And he tries to steal the U.S. belt. Well, in the ensuing conference, Six drops the video camera, so Malenko grabs it and clocks Guerrero with it, scoring the pin. So Dean Malenko, who is not the baby face, is getting cheered when he hits Eddie Guerrero in the face with the video camera. After the match, Malenko is seemingly filming the KO'd Guerrero and leaves the video camera, apparently as some sort of consolation prize. And here's what Dave reviews the match. Easily the best match on the show. Even more impressive when you consider that Guerrero had torn his peck about four minutes before the finish. At press time, he hadn't been checked out by a doctor. If he doesn't need surgery, he could be back in anywhere from three to six weeks, which postpones the planned triangle feud once again. If he does need surgery, it's a six-month recovery, three and three-quarter stars. I kind of forgot about this match, Tony. I was sleeping on this pay-per-view, but this match was outstanding. Wouldn't you agree? 
Oh, yeah, this was uh, very well done. And I like the fact that they, as Meltzer uh, said, and rightfully so, that they changed their match around to make it somewhat of a grudge match. Uh, that was very well done. And, and only guys who can really, really wrestle can do that. Uh, I like the finish. I like uh, I like Six getting involved in it to keep the NWO storyline going. And, and, you know, that the good thing that when he came in, they didn't just throw the match out. They actually had a finish to it. Uh, and uh, it, it, w- it was really good to see that the injury that was suffered didn't keep uh, Dean out for a long time. Because these uh, these pec tears or pec pops can, as you said, you can say you can be out for a long time if you need surgery or if you just give it some rest and some time to heal on itself. It doesn't take too long. That stuff like that happens in the NFL all the time. Um, there's a great line in here. The commentary is pretty fun here. You said something like, "I've been doing this for years," and Bobby replies, "One day you'll get good." I know. <laughs> Yeah. And I think it, it made me laugh. It, I mean, it, uh, again, you have to, you have to go back and listen to this commentary, man. It was good stuff. I, you know, I, I don't know what, I, I know a lot of shit was written about me back then. I get it. I understand. I didn't call Dave Meltzer. So, you know, he shit on me all the time, but I generally loved the shit, the stuff where Heenan ragged on me. I just thought that was good. You know, uh, Ventura did it all the time. And I just love when, when Heenan would say stuff like that and, and, you know, and jab me. I thought that was one of uh, the highlights of working with Heenan, setting him up to say shit like that. Okay. So let's talk about something I wanted to talk about for a long time. And it's the surgence of fandom from Dean Malenko fans. I, I never really saw this coming. I was always a Dean Malenko fan, but it feels like all of a sudden everybody's on board with Dean. And specifically one thing that stood out to me during this era was pro wrestling illustrated and pro wrestling illustrated was a big deal for a long time in the wrestling business. Was it not Tony? Well, of course it was. It's, it's, uh, pro wrestling illustrated is I I had subscriptions back in the day. I'm talking about back in the seventies and, and, uh, it stopped when I got married (laughs) in the eighties, but I had some subscriptions to that. And it was, uh, it's how you kept up with wrestling. It was, it was the way that you kept up with all the, the regions or territories back then. It was, it was spectacular. 1991, they start the pro wrestling illustrated 500, the PWI 500, where they rank the top 500 wrestlers. You want to guess who the number one wrestler in the world, according to pro wrestling illustrated was in 1991. Uh, I would guess it was Dean Malenko. 1992. It was sting 1993. It was Bret Hart 1994. It was Bret Hart. 1995, it was Diesel. Are you seeing a theme here? Whoever's the top guy with the belt, he's number one. 1996, it's Shawn Michaels. 1998, it's Steve Austin. 1999, it's Steve Austin. 2000, it's Triple H. Let's go back to 1997. Dean Malenko. It's always been fascinating to me that it has historically been the tippy top guy in the business. And they would continue that trend, you know, say in 06 and 07, it's John Cena. 08, it's Randy Orton. 09, it's Triple H. It's whoever the top guy is. But 1997, it's Dean Malenko. And Dean Malenko, the prior year, it was 13. And here in 97, he's number one. It's always been sort of the anomaly from the PWI 500 ranking system. Yeah, and, and I also uh, I kind of wonder, uh, Conrad, what went into that ranking system and what made them change? Uh, fan support for Dean Malenko? Maybe the announcer did a hell of a job of putting him over, or maybe he just was that good. Yeah, I think a lot of it, you know, they just decided, hey, we're going to put over who we think had some of the best matches. And Dean Malenko had great matches every time he went to the ring. I mean, I knew, even though what Dean Malenko maybe lacked in charisma or promo, he more than made up for with the matches. Once the bell rang, you were going to be entertained and he never let us down, but they went that way. And I couldn't help, but wonder maybe they tried this, put him on the magazine cover and maybe it wasn't the draw they had hoped for. Um, because in the end, what you're putting on the cover of your magazine is really the, the advertisement, as you would say, to sell the doggone thing. And if he's not a big draw, 
maybe they just don't do that again. But it is interesting because he's sort of there for one time only, 1997. Yeah. You know, and, uh, not really in the same vein, or but, but again, talking about Malenko, I may have mentioned this before, but I'm going to say it again. You know what I liked about Dean Malenko more than anything else? What's that? Dean Malenko, by far, was a completely different guy in the ring than he was in real life. And in his promos or in the way he acted. People ask me all the time, what kind of guy was Ric Flair? And I would always say, well, what you see with Ric Flair on TV is what you get. And we all know that. Sure. What you saw with Dean Malenko on TV was nothing, nothing like Dean Malenko. So I was always kind of amazed that he could have this persona of this Iceman Dean Malenko and a serious guy when in back he was, he was a funny son of a bitch and was very irreverent and was, was, a, was a great conversationalist. And it, it always amazed me that he could portray this Iceman. And I think that the portrayal of the Iceman, a serious guy, was was one of the things, of course, his work rate was a lot of it, but I think the portrayal of the Iceman, the way he uh, pulled it off, was one of the things that got him over. Well, let's talk about what's next here because we've got uh, an interesting promo from Mean Gene Okerlund. He's doing the hotline plug, and he welcomes in Roddy Piper, and then eventually the horseman, but not Ric Flair. Uh, the horsemen here are Deborah McMichael, Mongo McMichael, Chris Benoit, and Jeff Jarrett. Chat me up about this promo. The the, the <laughs> with Roddy Piper. <laughs> uh, yep. uh one of the most entertaining promos that we had had in a long, long time. Uh, because uh Piper was freestyling as Roddy Piper would be known to do. And of course, Gene Okerlin was the great straight the greatest straight man ever. Uh and the, the his play, uh the way he played off of Okerlin. Uh, the way he played off of uh, well, even Benoit, the way he played off of him and, and Mongo and, and the way he played off Jeff Jarrett, the way he, you know, tried to do the four horsemen, but popped everybody the bird. Uh, even Piper was so good in this promo that it even had Mongo do a good promo. Don't you think it even fired Mongo up to the point that he did a good promo. The only thing I didn't like about it is what do you think it is? Deborah was stuck in the background and she's so beautiful and looks so good. Why not put her out front? But I can understand that again, it's all about the wrestlers, but this is classic Roddy Piper stuff and classic Roddy Piper shit. And I, and I think it's, it's worth racking that thing up and, and watching it went on and on and on. And it was one of those promos to where it was so good. It may have had a certain time limit, but they just let it go because the Piper was so good at what he was doing. Well, you got to go watch it and hopefully we're going to have, um, our version of that promo before you, know it, which I think should be a mm. good time. Um, let's talk about the next match on the card because this is another underrated match to me. It's Ultimo dragon. One of my favorites pinning psychosis in 13 minutes and 17 seconds. Dave would write another very good match. The two weren't a hundred percent, but they worked very hard. Dragon was banged up after taking a bad bump on his head on Friday night at an arena Mexico match against Scorpio jr. And today said this was the first singles match between the, between the two. And Dave, of course, can't help, but correct it and say, I believe it was only the second since they had a match last year in Cali. Uh, of course we know, uh, ultimate mm -hmm. dragon gets the pin here. Uh, and he does so with a tiger suplex. And Dave can't help himself. He writes Rhodes and Heenan basically made fun of today's attempting to call all the unique spots three and a half stars. I love the match. What'd you think of Dave's criticism and the match itself? Well, yeah, uh, thank God Dave was there to correct Mike today about when he, how many times they actually did wrestle and for Dave Meltzer to say they weren't a hundred percent, you know, Dave, tell me what a hundred percent is in your book. Tell me what it is. You motherfucker. Uh, that's number one. And look, go back, go back and listen to this match and listen to the commentary about the rickshaw. Okay. It was hilarious. It was entertaining. You do not always have to call a match straight or, you know, or now we've got, 
You know, we got a luchador. We got someone from Japan who Dave Meltzer whacks off to every time he sees. They better call it straight. They better call it straight. They better not have fun with it. Fuck you. They had fun with it. Heenan and uh, and Dusty Rhodes were spectacular in this. So, you know, I, I don't, don't fuck him. Now I'm getting mad. Well, you know, you got you kind of need to address some of these anger issues because I feel like you had a meltdown earlier this week on Twitter. Do you want to smarten everybody up to what happened there? Uh, yeah, uh, I do. Uh, and I apologize. Look, <laughs> here I'm saying fuck him, and then I want to apologize to Dave Meltzer. Uh, somebody uh, came up with a, uh, a comment on Twitter uh, or uh, that Dave Meltzer in the 90s says that uh, Tony Schiavone, the number one person that Tony Schiavone hates with all his passion in the world is Jim Ross. And I saw that and I'm thinking, that lion, no good piece of shit. So I responded and say, well, that is not true, obviously, but uh, the only thing that POS Dave Meltzer ever wanted to do was to expose the business. And I read that after I, I sent it out. And another guy came back with another comment I had about Jim Ross, which was true uh, of how much I enjoyed working with Jim and how much we had such a, a very tough rivalry back then, but we respected each other and liked each other. And um, I read what I said and then I quickly did, or I didn't quickly, then I deleted it. It's probably still out there somewhere. Uh, And I I shouldn't let uh, guys like this uh, ramp up my anger. Uh, because uh, I've said many times, and God bless everybody who's on Twitter, who follows us, who uh, reacts to us in a positive light. I would say that of all the reactions that we get for this show, wouldn't you say, Conrad, 90% positive? Absolutely. Is that correct to say? Yeah, maybe more than 90%. And even you guys who are who don't react positive, you know, uh, if you got an opinion, that's fine. Quit being a prick about it. Uh and uh, so, but Twitter at times to me is like a cesspool of the worst of humanity. And it drew me into that and I shouldn't, ha- I shouldn't have done that. So I apologize about that tweet. So that's why you don't see me on Twitter that much because I'll go through and I'll see some of the stuff and then somebody will put something in there that really pisses me off. And I should just like, you know what I should do next time I see something on Twitter really pisses me off. I should take a breath and call you. And have you talk me down because not that my, not that I shouldn't have an opinion on what people say, but I just shouldn't fall into that trap. I should be above that. Just uh, letting it out makes you feel a little better. I feel so much better. Thank you very much for that. (laughs) Well, show me on the doll where he touched you. Yes. Dr. Conrad Thompson. It sure does. Let's move on. Let's talk about. Uh, I, mean, I guess we should mention here in this psychosis match, one of the things that, um, Dave does sort of take issue with is that they had psychosis take a kick from Sonny Ono. And he says it made him look like a fool. The spot made psychosis look like a total fool, but WCW is known for making all, but a few of its wrestlers look silly. What'd you think of, um, this whole commentary from Dave? about, and I guess you could argue that it's factual and you don't want one of the boys getting beat up by a manager. That's not the way this has always worked historically in wrestling. Boys get beat up by managers all the time. Uh, but I think he, in regards to, you know, you're doing it to get heat and maybe this was a heat with no payoff. Yeah. I, I, I see that side of it. Uh, I mentioned during the commentary that, you know, Sonny had a, a uh, a martial arts background, which he did, and it was a shoot. You know, he he was a competitor in uh, in judo and in karate. He and Eric Bischoff became friends, and they were just letting him show his stuff. And I thought the the kicks and blows that he threw were pretty legit, so that didn't bother me at all. I and of course, in anybody that just wants a straight Japanese luchador match would not abide by that. But uh, there there was nothing wrong with that at all. Nothing. Nothing. He's wrong about that. Gene Okerlund is out next and he does another hotline promo. And this time he's got a guest in diamond Dallas page in the middle of the promo. He starts calling out Randy Savage. And of course that means Randy Savage and miss Elizabeth are about to pop up. And when they do, 
it looks like they're in the crowd until they get a tighter shot and you realize, no, they're actually on the announcer stand. Right. And Savage is telling a story about walking through the airport with Miss Elizabeth and he walks past a magazine stand and he sees this magazine and he pulls out Playboy's nude celebrities. And he talks about the fact that his ex-girlfriend, Pamela Anderson, who he met on Baywatch is there and Cindy Crawford's there. Mm -hmm. And oh, look who the centerfold is. It's your wife, Kimberly. And it's made him change his opinion of DDP. Now seeing what he's seen, DDP, you're the man. And one of the things I never really understood here is Paige is sort of trying to sell that he's embarrassed or upset by this. Right. But he's in the fucking pictures with his wife posing for the camera so it's not like this is you know a a hacked cell phone situation where something was in the cloud this is something you set up a photo shoot for and tanned for and oiled up your wife for and smiled for the camera for in a studio and now it's on it so it's not like it's a ha ha gotcha and this is really just promotion for the magazine what do you think of this angle of course, from the back, Kimberly comes out. She's been completely spray painted in her dress, NWO. He goes to tend to her. Macho man attacks uh, DDP from behind, gets him down, pulls his shirt off, spray paints his back. And then she decides, no, I'm not going to let you pile drive him. I'm going to save him. So Savage holds her head down and spray paints her. Miss Elizabeth asks if she can spray paint her some. At the time, this was a cool angle. Looking back, it's like, eh, I don't know about this. What do you think, Tony? Well, you say here in 2018, ah, I don't know about this. And, and I, I know why you say that, because of what's out there now and what we've heard you know, about sexual harassment and all that's been going on in the media these days. Uh, the one thing I didn't like, two things I didn't like about this at that time. Number one, I did not like the fact that uh, Paige, as it's pretty apparent what uh, Savage is doing, Paige said, don't go there to Savage. I remember thinking at that time, why not go there? Why would you be embarrassed about it? Kind of what, what you've been just saying. Why, you know, don't approach it that way uh, because... You know, I mean, it would probably be something. Well, anyway, it, it just didn't fit. Uh, the other thing I didn't like about it is that Gene Okerlund opened up with Paige. And I don't know if this was Gene uh, freestyling or not. He opened up with Paige talking about then the fact that Rick Steiner was down. WCW's team was down one man, maybe. And we had, uh, you know, kind of theorized that maybe someone would come to the rescue maybe Diamond Dallas Page would be the man that would step up and help out WCW. Gene Oakland opened up with that line, and Page completely ignored it. Uh, so that makes me think that Gene was freestyling on that. In reality, if you try to insert logic into all of this shit, Page should have been involved in that final match. Uh, because if he wanted to get his hand on the macho man Randy Savage, get his, you know, I mean, look, yeah, he was hitting the hit back of the head with a, with a spray can and oil, maybe he had a concussion, maybe he can't come back out. Uh, I, I don't know. But if you want to get his hands on the macho man, Randy Savage, why not run out with the WCW team? So I didn't like that line leading into it. I didn't like Paige trying to, uh, you know, portray what was happening. I kind of like the fact, what I did like about it was Liz turning really heel and spray painting uh, Kimberly. I like that part of it. Well, I mean, it was a, uh, it was a hot angle at the time and I don't know that, um, sure. Logically it makes a lot of sense, but in theory, if a dude's parading around with naked pictures of your wife, that's something to get hot about. And it's something that they really built WrestleMania eight around with flair and savage. So here we are with a different version of this, except now savage has the pictures, but the pictures were readily available when that magazine comes out. Is there talk in the locker room? I mean, they're even sort of joking about it in the NWO promo. We talked about it a few minutes ago with Hogan, Savage, Hall, and Nash. And and Hall saying things like, man, I thought Silicon Valley was in Los Angeles or whatever. And so they're, they're making all these jokes. And Hogan himself is just really piling on the jokes here. Is that something that uh, anybody was sort of ribbing Paige about? Were there whispers in the locker room? I mean, this feels like something that 
in the sophomoric atmosphere that wrestling locker rooms can be at times based on what we've heard. I've never been in one. Do you know what I mean? That, um, this would be something that would be pretty popular to discuss. Well, yeah, but you know, it, it, not on a ribbing basis. We all, I, I think, well, I don't think I know that almost everybody thought that Kimberly was one of the most beautiful women there. She, sure. like she was a 10. Arn Anderson talked about that with me a lot. She's, he says she's legitimate a 10. And uh, for her to be on in the nude in that magazine was not, uh, was, was not something you laughed about or something that you ribbed him about. It's something that you looked at and said, hey, well, yeah, why not? Why not have one of the most beautiful women on TV in this magazine? So I, I don't, with the exception of the NWO doing their ribbing, and they always did their ribbing on camera and backstage, uh, there wasn't that much talk about it being embarrassing or giving Paige a hard time about it. Not at all. Good. Well, let's go on to the next match because this uh, feels like it's out of a time machine. We've got Glacier taking on Mortis. And, you know, this probably felt like really good ideas once upon a time. But now with the NWO here, it has a layer of realism that maybe doesn't translate to this angle. They go nine minutes and four seconds. Of course, Glacier gets the pin. Uh, and here's what was written about it in the Observer. The two have been practicing this match literally for months at the power plant and also did the match in Germany for a tour in December. It had the look and feel of a match put together extensively and carefully in the gym by two green wrestlers. Mortis shows a lot of potential and has good size. Some of the wrestling spots were good. The martial arts spots, particularly the kicking, mainly looked slow and fake, but sometimes looked good. It's hard to get over these guys as martial arts and experts in a promotion with guys that have the best kicker in the business, Dragon, Six, and Sonny Ono, whose stuff all looks so much better. Um, Glacier finally hit the kick for the pin, and after the match, Mortis knocked Glacier out with his staff, and Vandenberg signaled for someone to come down, and it turned out to be Brian Clark, the former Adam Bomb from the WWF. No idea what he'll be called here, and the two left Glacier lay laying a star in three quarters match. And this was billed as a martial arts match. Yeah. What'd you think? Glacier Mortis. Yeah, it, I, I, it wasn't good at all. And if it was a martial arts match, it didn't become one. It became a regular wrestling match, which was confusing. Uh, because if there's going to be a martial arts match, let's use whatever martial arts rules are. Right. I, I guess, I don't know. Maybe. Maybe it's the forerunner of uh, mixed martial arts. I don't know. But, you know, when I first saw this match come out, you know what I thought of? What's that? The start it. Mortal Kombat! Johnny Cage. You had to like that movie when you were younger. No, I didn't like the movie. I liked the video game, but the movie sucked ass. Really? Yeah, you liked that? Yeah, Sonya Blade. Yeah, Mortal Kombat. Took the kids to see it, and that 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 music hit, and the kids went nuts. They were into that shit, and that's why that's why Eric came up with that, right? He thought the kids the kids would like it. I'm just saying, do you have any idea how fucking silly what you just did is? <laughs> and you were not even considering anything with wrestling 13 months ago, and now. You just fucking sang the Mortal Kombat theme song, and there's, I don't know, a million people who will hear that mm. and grew up with you as like the voice of their childhood, mm. and now you're being silly jackass slap dick <laughs> singing the Mortal Kombat theme song. Yeah, I know. Scorpion. Oh, da. Sub Zero. Oh, I oh. Dun, 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 Mortal Kombat. My, my job here is done. I love that shit, man. Uh, next up, it. we got uh, Marcus Alexander Bagwell. You gonna say anything here? <sighs> nah, yeah. Cut another promo in the camera, you dumbass. Marcus Bagwell beat Scotty Riggs in a strap-on match here in 12 minutes and 25 seconds. Melsworth would write, they whipped the hell out of each other, and Bagwell looked great from a personality standpoint, but Riggs had nothing, and the match went on twice as long as it should have. It got so boring. At least did a new finisher rather than the classic strap match finish. 
In this, Riggs took a bad bump over the top rope and sold it like he was immobilized. Bagwell then dragged him around to all four corners for the win, a star and a quarter. Uh, what do you remember about this strap-on match? Yeah, I remember that. Here's what I remember about the strap-on match, and I was reinforced by watching it again. Oh, Marcus, man, you're in the middle of a strap match. I even said it. You're in the middle of a strap match, and you you, you cut a promo? What? Yeah, yeah, fuck. What I remember about the match is, and Meltzer, did Meltzer say this? Commentary was fucking great. Bobby Heenan and uh, Dusty Rhodes talking about uh, a bag of cement. Need to listen to it. It was phenomenal. It really was. It was hilarious shit. So when Heenan said, but a bag of cement doesn't have legs. <laughs> I popped big time on that one. So that's what I remember about it. Well, and then, of course, him cutting the promos in the camera during the heat of the match. I just didn't get that. So Buff's wearing a collar. They're, they're using strap-ons here. Yeah. Um, of course, well, you know. Before, have, you ever had a, have you ever had a strap-on match? No. Okay. That doesn't happen much, and I don't even think it's legal in Alabama. I'm pretty sure it's not legal in Alabama. Really? Yeah. There's a lot of things legal in Alabama that's not legal anywhere else. Are you sure? I'm, I'm pretty sure. Okay. How about you? Has uh, what does Lois? How does she feel about strap-on matches? Well, she she doesn't want to have anything to do with them. But the, it, uh, it's an old favorite of yours, right? I mean, the rumor and innuendo is that you and Klondike were big fans of these strap-on matches. Well, we 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 we. Uh, <clears throat> we never, uh, p- 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 partic- participated in a, in a, those matches, but we would have loved to do commentary had there been one to do commentary for. Yeah. Klondike Bill doing commentary on a strap on match. Seems like a good time. Yeah. Cause he, he would have dropped the microphone and done a run in. Chat me up. There's a rumor out there. Of course, this is the breakup of the American males. And we're going to talk about them, but there's a rumor out there that before Scotty Riggs got the nod as an American male, that Tommy dreamer may have been considered for that spot, but ultimately Riggs got the nod. Maybe Tommy turned it down. Maybe Tommy was never offered the spot. Do you remember there being discussion about maybe Tommy dreamer being one half of the American males? Uh, there was no discussion about that, that I was aware of Tommy dreamers name never came up with us. Let's talk about at all the American males theme song, which I still believe is arguably top five all time in wrestling, especially WCW because, and we've talked about this a lot, the naturals theme song, which was phenomenal. Yeah. There's been so many really hilarious theme songs. Do you remember the American males theme song? And can you maybe sing that for us? I know you just did. The other one. I mean, I know you just did Mortal Kombat, but could you break out a little American males for us? You know what? I, I cannot. Can you uh, sing a few bars and maybe I can get into it here? Why don't we just try this? Mortal Kombat! <laughs> Got a cage. Chen Lu. American males. American males. American males. I got it now. American males. 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 Oh, that was it, right? Favorite part of the deal is you're like, I don't know the words to that. <laughs> I remember it now, buddy. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Jimmy, Jimmy Hart at his best. We need to talk to Jimmy about that one. Allegedly, Randy Pui Anderson received yeah. the key to the city of Rome, Georgia on March 4th. And that makes the news. And he was our uh, referee for this match. How in the world does Pee Wee Anderson get the key to the city of Rome, Georgia? Uh, well, Rome, Georgia is a very Western Georgia pushed up against the state of Alabama. You know, I mean, it's nothing happened in Rome, Georgia. 
uh, yeah, it's Floyd County. Look, hey, Rome, Georgia was also, who else was from Rome, Georgia? Uh, the greatest spine buster of all time. Yes. Marty, Marty Lundy. Ab- absolutely. Arn Anderson. And, and for all, all the badass promos that he could cut, all the great work that he can do. Okay. Arn Anderson is nothing but a slap ass redneck. And there you see it. Randy Anderson gets the key to the city full of Arn Anderson's and Randy Pee Wee Anderson. That's what I'm saying though. Uh, Pee Wee gets the key to the city. Right. And Arn Anderson does not. Yeah. I understand what you're saying. I understand what you're saying, but you know what? If you go back now, have they done anything for Arn Anderson since then? Hell, Arn Anderson should be, uh, they should have an Arn Anderson day in Rome, Georgia. Wouldn't you think? I'm not knocking that. Yeah. And I'm not saying that Pee Wee isn't deserving, but I'm saying it is a bit like if they gave the key to the city, I don't know, for Charlotte to Don Carnoodle. (laughs) Like Don's a cool guy. Don did stuff in the business. Roll Tide. I'm not anti Don, but you know, about a little nature boy action. Yeah. But, but Don got hurt by the Russians right before star K 84 and could not compete, but he was going to be there. Thank God. We talked to his dad. We talked to his mom. Don't get people excited about Star Kid D4. We're never covering that on the show. The, our list. Okay. Our list. I'm just going back in time. Okay. I'm going back in time. We got three episodes. And Tony Shiv- or four episodes and- left, and that's not one of them. So don't tease something we can't deliver. Okay. And Tony Shivani was young and good looking back then and thin. That's fake news. So one of the highlights on this show is you guys show a clip that had already been shown on TV, but I don't know how many people are digging through old Nitro archives, but here it is, man. It's the Steiners Hall and Nash car accident. So we hear Hall and Nash, um, driving a car and, you know, just talking back and forth. And we don't know who's driving necessarily or who's holding the camera, but they're shotgun together and they run into the Steiners who are driving like an 86 Chevy Lumina. And, um, when they bump them, the Steiners pull over a little bit to the uh, shoulder of the road and start throwing trash out. Scott Steiner does. Eventually they get on Rick's side. Who's driving force him off the road. He flips the vehicle on its head. Whose idea was this? It is sort of hokey. It is sort of soap opera like, but I really did think they did a pretty good job with this skit. What can you tell us about this? It was very well done. And if you go back and watch this kind of frame for frame, the camera kind of, you know, there's a little bit of a jogging, right? And that enables them to put Ellis, our stuntman, in the car and drive the car over and on its side like that. It really wasn't the Steiners. It was the Steiners in the car until the flip. And just a just a frame off, uh, the camera like, you know, jogs and jogs away from it, a couple frames off, enabled them to put Ellis in. Ellis, by the way, uh, was our stuntman. And I understand is uh, and lives in Georgia. And still is a, is a stunt man that Vince uses. He's still with the company today, 2018. Yeah, he sure is. Uh, so I remember watching that. I remember going, holy shit, that was great. The flip side is there was a lot of heat about that. And, and a lot of the heat came from Doug Dellinger. Because Doug said, in reality, that is a crime. Absolutely. And that should not be put on TV. You know, do things in the ring, foreign objects, whatever. It's all part of the wrestling. But to try to wreck someone and flip their car and then run away from it is, you know, trying to inflict damage. And then it's hit and run. And we put that on TV. So there was a lot of heat uh, uh, about that. And uh, Doug was one of the people that was very vocal about that being done. In theory, it sounded very good. The way they pulled it off was great, but as a result, it probably it should have never seen the light of day on TV. Because you think it maybe inspired kids to do silly bullshit like this? Well, it could. Sure. I mean, look, uh, no, well, we're, we're going out of the ring and we're showing someone commit a crime. Well, but I mean, in fairness, though. You guys are setting motherfuckers on fire, throwing them off bill a couple of years prior to yeah. through the giant off the goddamn building. And then the Yeti even butt fucked him. And now all of a sudden, you know, public sodomy is okay. Pushing people off buildings. Okay. Flipping cars is not. Yeah. That would be the Yeti motherfucker. Sorry. My okay. bad. Uh, I, I, uh, 
yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. It just, uh, I, I guess maybe Doug being the policeman uh, was very vocal about that. What, and that led to what, us thinking about it. I don't know. What did Doug think about you guys blowing up a boat with passengers on it. Yeah. <laughs> hey, very good. I don't know. What was, was Doug? There? That was done by, that was done by Turner home entertainment and not by WCW. Was Doug there right. when La when Vader shot, I mean, when Jake Roberts shot lasers out of his eyes. <laughs> yes. And he was pissed off about that. Was Doug there? He said, now he said, now all the kids out there want to put lasers in their eyes and shoot and blow up somebody. Was Doug there when the horseman pulled dusty out of their car, out of his car and, and broke his hands. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're not going to cover that. That's way back in the crocket air. I don't want to, to cover that. That's a good call. Cause we've only got a couple of shows left. We're going to get people's hopes up. Let's talk about, uh, the next skit here, which is this NWO interview. They're all and <laughs> Meltzer writes. They appeared to be pretending to be stoned. Uh, and they pretend very well. I thought that was pretty funny. And even Meltzer references that they're talking about Kimberly, uh, sort of a rambling all over the place promo, something you should probably go see though. Something else worth seeing, at least to me, I enjoyed it, was the Harlem Heat public enemy match. They have a tornado match that goes 13 minutes and 17 seconds. Well, sort of right. This was an ECW style brawl using all kinds of objects, such as a garbage can, a can lid, toilet seat, frying pan, and cookie sheet. Most of the shots were really stiffed. Uh, Sherry got into the big act as well. Uh, Johnny Grunge is bleeding here, but you guys don't ever really shoot it close or make any reference to it. Uh, in the end, it's said that the match went about five minutes too long because they just did the same thing over and over. But Meltzer wrote certainly a much better match than it appeared to be on paper going in public enemy finally put Booker T through a table. And then Jeff Jarrett and Steve McMichael came out and McMichael hit Rocco with a briefcase. So Booker T was able to use the Harlem hangover, the somersault leg drop and get a pin here. Two and a half stars. Obviously, it's a serious match, but you guys are really hamming it up during the commentary. What did you think of this match? Yeah, well, I thought the match was. I thought it was a. I thought it was a hell of a match. I really did. It was. It was uh, brutal. They, and you know, Sherry was great on the outside as always. You know, Sherry was. Sherry was a badass man, and they used her correctly when they used her with. Harlem Heat. I thought Sherry, we talked about this. Sherry with Harlem Heat was the best. Uh, and the commentary about, and just listen to Dusty Rhodes and Bobby Heenan, and even me, I guess, but listen to those guys. Ham it up. Is it right? No, but I mean, Dusty Rhodes and Bobby Heenan reacted to what they saw in the ring the way you would think Dusty Rhodes and Bobby Heenan would react to what they saw in the ring. I mean, do we have to say that every time someone picks up a trash can and hits a guy in the head with it, that we got to be serious about it? Oh, that could hurt him. Well, hell yeah, it could hurt him. Why not have fun with it too? I don't think it took away anything from the match. I think it added to it. Uh, and uh, it, it it reminds me kind of going back to, uh, uh, to the uh, commentary that we had on the Russell War show or the World War III show later on. Uh, and the, the the commentary that was very very good, uh, so yeah, liked it a lot. I think two and a half stars is very unkind. I would give it three stars. I would give it three and three quarter. No, three and uh, I'm sorry. Uh, and this may blow De Dave Meltzer's mind. I would give it three and seven eight stars, uh, or maybe three and four eight. Now it would be a half. Three and six eight stars. No, no, make it uh, seven sixteenth stars. Yeah, that's it. Next up in the match, or the next match we see is uh, Prince Ikea uh, retaining the television title over Rey Mysterio Jr. The crowd was absolutely silent for Prince Ikea. I don't know if it's necessarily a fair a fair deal for him here. I mean, he's in a in a, in a really uh, unfavorable spot, is he not? Yeah, he is because. He's uh he's in the uh he's in the match uh right before the main event. And if anything, you know, you think, well, maybe that match should be early. Uh, you know, Malenko and um Eddie started the match and you like the match to uh, the pay-per-view to start off hot. 
They did a good job of that and moving that a little bit earlier, what probably would have been better. They didn't buy the match. They didn't buy Prince Iakea, but I really liked the finish of it. Really did. And the fans got with the finish, don't you think, at the end? Because uh, Prince Iakea, uh Ray asked for uh, some more time that he thought he almost beat him. We rang the bell out of the middle of nowhere. You know, we didn't have a countdown for the uh, 15-minute time limit, but you knew it was coming because Mike Tanay kept saying, uh, this is now a 15-minute time limit instead of 10. The bell rang out of the middle of nowhere. Uh, probably should have had a countdown, 3 two, one and then Prince IAK said, okay, I will give you more time. Must be a winner. You think now that Ray's going to go over, and Prince goes over. And it's 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 a kind of a good swerve there. I, I like the way it finished up, and I thought the fans, even though they were absolutely dead for Prince IAK, uh, were, pretty, uh, were pretty with this uh, finish here. Meltzer wrote, uh, by this point in the show, the crowd was waiting for the main event, so they had no patience for these guys. Not to make excuses, because as mentioned previously, the IAK underdog gimmick is totally dead and nobody cares. And they seem to have come close to succeeding in killing Mysterio Jr. by having him do too many jobs for a gimmick performer and ruining his illusion by putting him in too often with the heavyweights. There's nothing wrong with the match as far as work, but they didn't tell a story. It was mainly just doing spots that didn't miss and lots of high flying. But the crowd at this point wouldn't have accepted a slow builder anyway. Tanay announced ahead of time that there was a 15 minute time limit, which pretty much gave away what they were doing. Obviously, after the restart, we know what's going down here. Uh, by the way, I should mention the bell actually rang at 11:57, according to Meltzer. Not uh, that's good for Dave. Uh, wait a minute, back up. Dave said we know what's going to go down here now. Yeah, he knew that IK would win it. Well, no, I, don't th- I think he means that they're going to do the time limit draw thing. Oh, okay. Because you guys hadn't been announcing time limit. Right, right. But the- exactly. Yeah. All right. I, I see where you're going. And he's right about that. Okay. Um, of course, Iakea reverses a cradle pin uh, and gets the win in the restart. Meltzer writes, the finish made Mysterio Jr. look bad and that he cried for more time and then still couldn't be the guy, beat the guy that everybody still considers a jobber. Star and a half. In my research this week, Tony, I was shocked to see how old Prince Iakea is. If you had to... Uh, venture a guess as to how old Ikea was today, what would your guess be? Uh, he would be 41. 53. <laughs> 53? 53. Holy shit. He was trained by Dean one? Malenko, which explains why he was a good performer, uh, but he never really, of course, got over. We know he would go on to be known as the artist formerly known as sort of riffing on Prince later. Right. WCW, but his debut here and sort of uh, splash onto the scene as a television title contender, although it maybe didn't resonate with the crowd long term, I really thought it was cool that you guys introduced a new character and tried to actually push it. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with trying to do that. I agree with you. You got to have new characters, you got to do something different. And why not have a new character come in and be kind of an underdog uh, and win a title and be very humble about it? I had no problem with Prince Iakea and all that stuff. You know, I don't think the fans, I don't think the fans were sitting on their hands just waiting for the main event and can't wait for it. I just think they just didn't buy into Prince Iakea. I feel like we should mention here that um, we've got sort of a fun promo for Spring Stampede here with the horseman on horseback on a Western set. Yeah. What the fuck is this, Tony? uh, Two things. Rick Flair on a fucking horse. Are you kidding me? The only thing Rick Flair and a horse have in common is, you know, uh, and Arn Anderson wearing a hat that they had to go to some hat store, obviously in uh, Texas to get a hat his size because he has the biggest head ever, even bigger than yours. Uh, just fucking hilarious. And having him ride off with Flair on, or I, I don't know if that was Flair on that horse really riding off or not, or a guy with blonde hair riding off, but just Flair sitting on that horse. I popped when I saw that, when I watched it. Because, you know, uh, these promos that, that that we put in there for these pay-per-views, we never saw those things ahead of time. We didn't, we never knew what, the, what they were doing. And uh, <laughs> he didn't have a great comic coming out of that. The hat that Arn Anderson had on had the holes for the donkey ears. <laughs> uh, 
Heenan. Oh my God. Let's talk about the main event. Uh, team NWO beat team Piper and team WCW in the main event of yeah. 19 minutes and 22 seconds. Meltzer wrote, this was one of those booked on acid main events. Here are your steps for the match. If WCW wins, the NWO must give up all their belts to the WCW executive committee and the NWO must leave WCW for 36 months. If Piper's team wins, then Piper gets a cage match against Hogan down the road. And if the NWO wins, then they get to vibe for any title, any place at any WCW event. So after TV on Monday, the whole selling point of team Piper was that flair and Piper were going to be side by side once again, but there's no flair here and no explanation as to why. Uh, and he's in Savannah the next night on nitro, a gossip column in the Atlanta area said that flair and Andre, the giant were spotted together at Jack and Jill's. Of course, the <laughs> Andre, the giant was dead and they <laughs> the giant for Andre chat me up. Why flair not on this pay-per-view and instead drinking with the ghost of Andre, the giant <laughs> Jack and Jill's in Atlanta. Uh, Rick was not on this pay-per-view because of prior commitments. And that's all I'm going to say about that. What, what does that mean? You're, you're promoting him on Monday. Yeah. Now on Sunday, he's not there and you're hitting us with some bullshit, uh, double secret information. What are you talking about? Well, look, it, it was, it was Rick had a, you know, this as well as I do. Rick had at, at times a very uh, frosty relationship with whoever was in charge. And Flair just didn't want to do the match that night and could get by with it. Does that make any sense to you? So he said, I don't want to do it. I'm out of here. Yeah. I'll, I'll see you at Nitro. We'll have a drink with the ghost. He's probably had sex with a ghost in Bula. That's not very uh, professional, is it not? Okay. Uh, no. You know, that's not normally the rap on Ric Flair. You know, we expect that type of behavior from some other guys. And we yeah, look, buddy, it was something that, that it wasn't like, it wasn't like I'm just not going to show up and we get to the arena that day and we say, uh, where is he? He's supposed to be here. It's something that he and he and Bischoff discussed, and Bischoff realized, okay, you're not you're going to get that. I do not want after to, Rick on, Steiner is I do injured, not want to be the guy like here that said that Ric Flair was unprofessional. That's not it at all. That is not it. He just had a prior commitment. What was the commitment? I don't know. I, that now see you, you. I knew you would get in that word. Shivani would say, "I don't know," but I don't. He had a prior commitment. He was drinking with Andre the Giant's ghost. Well, okay. You know what? Let's let's call him on our next podcast and ask him, hey, what the fuck? We saw you riding on a horse. How come you wouldn't wrestle that night? Let's ask him that. You know, he actually, he sings a song about riding horses. What? Yeah. No, really? Yeah, he does. We'll have him do it one day. We got three episodes left. We'll fit him in. Right. Um, here's what Meltzer wrote after Rick Steiner was injured. It's like, there isn't one wrestler in WCW to step forward. Right. Did we just do the storyline at war games, war game storyline with the war games finish. And neither of these main events were any good either. Not to mention the show was being advertised as the last man standing. And the only way to be eliminated was pinfall or submission. But now they're sticking in the over the top rope rule. Uh, without any advertising as to quietly just slip it into the ring introductions to the point that apparently even the announcers don't know. So he's pretty critical of the decision here to add over the top rope eliminations. And it's sort of weird where you guys are just running down one after another, instead of it being, you know, in regular increments, can you make any sort of rhyme or reason as to how this match was put together? This was one of those matches that was put together by Hulk Hogan, Eric Bischoff. And this was a match that was pretty apparent that once it developed, and there was some heat about this, Conrad, 
uh, from the boys without naming names. It was pretty apparent that this entire paper, this entire finish of this match was for Dennis Rodman. That's all it was. Rodman got Piper out. Rodman had the spray paint, the can, got involved in the match many, many ways. And here we are taking our product and putting a basketball player over with it because he's a friend of Hogan's. And that's what this was about. And it's one of those things where they changed the rules as they went along leading up to it. I mean, it kind of got to me like with the over the top row, but kind of like morphed into a, like a battle Royal. Yeah. It's like, it's like a fucked up shitty version of the Royal rumble. Right. And that's what it was. That's exactly what it was. Well, let's talk about how it came to be, because this is the episode where Dennis Rodman has been teased all day, especially during the NWO promo and Dennis Rodman now in hindsight might not have seemed like a big deal, but he was one of the biggest stars in the world in 1997 here, uh, to the point that he's got, you know, book deals and television deals and he's all over the tabloids and, uh, he's been traded around to different teams and he's winning championships and he's doing crazy stuff with his hair and he's being fined and uh he's getting new tattoos and piercings and showing up to public events in a wedding dress pulling up all yep. the stops to go ahead and and court as much attention as possible and it works for wrestling um Meltzer would write hogan and rodman made the big entrance spending three minutes outside the ring posing for photos for the press rather than bothering with the match going on Fans were chanting for Sting at this point. Once Hogan and Rodman made it to the ring, Piper and Hogan had one brawl in the aisle, which Hogan at least tried to make look good, but poor Piper physically just had nothing left. Piper took a bump over the top when Rodman pulled down the ropes. Um, we know what the finish is going to be here. They're doing the ringside confrontation. Everybody's uh, backpedaling Rodman. And then finally, the NWO guys jump on Piper and uh, they start choking him with a chain. You know what's coming. Lots of, of posing and uh, photo ops for Rodman, including Lex Luger, who you guys put over uh, as being a valiant effort. The match only gets a star, though. Everybody's essentially left laying. And then we see something we didn't expect. I thought it was sort of weird that we're going off the air with an NWO win. But in reality, Sting comes down from the rafters and starts destroying folks, specifically Hall and Nash. And he's pointing his bat in the aisle at both Hogan and Rodman. And it's the first time that we really see Sting let everybody know whose side he's on. Up until this point, he'd just been sitting in the rafters and you thought he was the WCW, but you didn't really know because he's in black and white. But here he comes down from the top, Scorpion death drop for a couple of the outsiders. And it's very clear that Sting is here and he's anti-NWO and we really start our build for Starcade 97 right here and Dennis Rodman's here so it is a big opportunity you know from the the 30,000 foot flight view of this this is a really big angle for WCW even if the match really made no fucking sense at all it was a great way to go off hot we did i mean i was screaming Shit like that. But want to inject some logic into this? Okay, I will. Thank you very much for asking. And this is what I was thinking there at this time. If they say, we want Sting, we want Sting, and he's on WCW side, why didn't he drop down earlier? He was up there, apparently. I mean, and you can't always inject logic into this, but I just think the Sting thing was maybe the match should have been going on longer, 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 longer towards the end of the show and Sting dropped down and clean house then. Uh, I just thought that when the fans are chanting, we want Sting, we want Sting. Well, let's bring him in. Well, we didn't. Waited till everything cleared and then Sting came down. I just thought that the timing was off there, but I, I think it was a very good way to end a pay-per-view. And Sting got a huge, huge reaction. Yes, he did. Um, 
Here it is from the observer Bischoff and Hogan attended the bulls Knicks game on March 9th to shoot promos with Rodman Bischoff is in an NWO shirt and he's visible behind the Knicks bench the entire game. The announcers never once during the game brought up Rodman's wrestling deal. Meltzer reported the week before that, that Rodman had just signed with WCW and that WCW was able to outmaneuver the WWF, which had also been pursuing Dennis Rodman. Apparently the WWF had offered Rodman uh, a two show deal for $1 million, but Rodman's representatives ever since Rodman worked a WCW show back in July of 95 as Hogan's corner man, they had sort of been friendly with WCW. So they go to WCW to match the offer. And WCW was able to pull off this deal for an undisclosed figure, which we've got to guess was at least what the WWF was offering. Do you remember ever hearing the number, the amount of money that Robin was paid for this? I heard 1.5. There you go. Um, Rod- and that's what I heard. Now, I didn't see any pay stub or anything like sure. that, but I had heard that they offered a million. We said we'll go a million, a million and a half with it. So. So Rodman's in his last year with the Chicago Bulls. He's going to be a free agent at the end of that contract. And that contract is not going to prohibit him from passive participation in something like wrestling, meaning he could be in the corner, but he couldn't really work a match at this point, which is why we wouldn't see any of that happen until the season was over. WCW got some mainstream publicity out of this over the next few days. Most newspapers didn't carry the story, but a couple of did. a couple of them did. And, uh, a few people on the radio and TV sort of ran through it almost as like a joke. Uh, Howard Stern wound up giving it the most attention because Hogan and Rodman were on Howard Stern on March the 10th and Stern was pretty much blowing off Hogan's attempts to plug the WCW pay-per-view and instead just concentrate on Rodman. And it doesn't feel like. This was the most planned effort WCW ever had, but they did get a little bit of mainstream attention from a big star at the time. We haven't spent a lot of time talking about Rodman on the show. What was your interaction with him like? What was the overall reception from the from the boys? Do you think it was a worthwhile investment for WCW? Well, if you're looking for some mainstream crossover, it yes, it was. Um, I had no interaction with Dennis Rodman at all. None of us did. He stayed uh, with Hogan. He arrived with Hogan. He was Hogan's buddy. And I never made an attempt to go in and say, hey, Tony Schiavone, nice to meet you. I didn't do that because that I've never been like that, really. Um, so he kind of stayed away from everybody and gave off the presence that, I, with the exception of the guys he was probably working with, but kind of gave off the perception that he was kind of above us, bigger star than us in the back. Uh, whether that was a correct perception that we had or not, could have been a real good guy. Had I tried to engage him in conversation or something like that, maybe it's my fault. I, I don't know. But just got the feeling that, yeah, he's this is Dennis Rodman. He's a big-time uh, you know, media star, not necessarily a, a, a basketball star, but a big-time media star, and he's kind of above all this. Same thing when, uh, you know, when we had uh, – uh, when we had uh, Shaquille O'Neal with Hogan in 94, you know, he's kind of above all this type thing. You know, they got their people with them and they're kind of above all this. Uh, you know, we had a lot of crossover people. Probably the coolest uh, that we had throughout the years was Jay Leno um, to deal with and to interact with and being nice to people. Just, just one of the great guys. But most guys who were big time stars that, were in the backstage area, were big time stars and weren't one of the boys. Uh, overall, the show got 39.7% thumbs up from the observer reader poll. It got 43.4% thumbs down and 16.9% thumbs in the middle. So more thumbs down than thumbs up. But overall, I thought this was a much better pay per view than WrestleMania 13, with the exception of the one match at WrestleMania 13 that everybody still talks about. Uh, Brett and Austin, I thought this was a good pay-per-view told a good story. Great time to be a wrestling fan. Uh, the worst match, uh, was, was voted to be the main event, of course. And, uh, the best match was Dean Malenko and Eddie Guerrero. And if you're fans of those guys, I can't recommend this show enough. Overall, what would you say here, Tony? Thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs in the middle. No, it's thumbs up, uh, for a number of reasons. 
the uh, what could have been a a terrible clusterfuck of a Texas tornado match turned out to be a damn good one uh, because of Malenko and Eddie Guerrero uh, and because of the way the pay per view ended. Look, a lot of a lot of those thumbs down from the Melterites are going to be because they all hate Hogan, and he went over in this. Uh, that's why the thumbs down. You can't fool me. Bullshit. That's why the thumbs down. Uh, so I liked it. It was a thumbs up show. And uh, again, I had forgotten some stuff that happened and I forgot my feelings back then that it happened. The only thing I did not like about the show was this. And we discussed this already. That if there is this war between WCW and I brought this up to Eric, uh, and uh, I, I think, you know, I would bring things up to Eric and he would nod and discuss things. I don't think, not sure that he ever took my, uh, my feedback seriously, or maybe I just didn't give enough of it to warrant being serious about it. I was kind of like, okay, I'm going to do my job. Fuck it and go home. Uh, the only thing I didn't like about, and I brought this up to Eric was that if we're in this war against the NWO, why doesn't someone come to sub for Rick Steiner? and someone make it even out. Like, the obvious choice was Diamond Dallas Page. He was there, right? And he was over. And they did this angle with the Macho Man Randy Savage, which, you know, ended up the Savage and and Page had a great run. But why not have him come in and and attack Savage and be the fourth man in the NWO or for for WCW? That's the only thing I didn't like really about this pay-per-view was – that logic. Well, there was no logic in that to me. This Thursday in Orlando, see the final four for the MLW World Heavyweight Championship Tournament. Thursday, March 8th, Matt Riddle versus ACH, Jimmy Havoc versus Shane Strickland, plus Low Key battles MVP in an unsanctioned match, and bad boy Joy Janela fights Darby Allen in a Fans Bring the Weapons match. Go to MLWTickets.com and get your tickets today. And when you're done listening to this, maybe listen to another MLW podcast such as Kevin Sullivan's Hell of a Deal, where Kevin Sullivan and MSL discuss WrestleMania booking, how Bruno would have done as an NWA champion, and the first half of the January 5th, 1998 WCW Monday Nitro. Or check out the newest Eastern Lariat episode. It focuses on the return of the Golden Lovers, Honor Rising, and the upcoming New Japan cards, including Strong Style Evolved in Long Beach. Furthermore, Striga and Dylan discuss the newest developments in All Japan, DDT, and Joshi Wrestling. On Marty and Sarah Love Wrestling, they're going to cover Paige's alternate tattoo ideas, as well as some fun hot takes on the Elimination Chamber, all on the road to WrestleMania. And coming soon, why it ended with... All on MLW Radio. Go to MLWRadio.com. Or if you want to go see some live wrestling action in the Orlando area, March 8th, check out MLWTickets.com today. I'm Matt Kuhn. You can reach me at Matt Kuhn Music on Twitter. The Weekly Run-In. It's Matt Kuhn! Let's get to some questions. We asked if you had a question, go ahead and fire it off to us. It's at WHW Monday on Twitter. Uh, Ricky Morton's mullet wants to know, I loved Randy Anderson and his reactions to the strap match. He had always been one of my favorite people in WCW and I met him at a house show in Kentucky in 1991. Any good Pee Wee stories you can share? Yeah. Pee Wee, uh, we had a, if you remember, uh, we had a girl that I talked about who was our stage manager, Wendy Turnbuckle. And, uh, Wendy, although I liked Wendy a great deal, Wendy could be very opinionated and very surly. And, uh, Randy Anderson did not like her at all, at all. And anytime someone, uh, jumped on Wendy about doing something wrong, uh, Wendy was kind of, uh, Annette Yoder's little girl. Uh, here was the, here was the hierarchy as it stood when we started getting really hot. Eric Bischoff was the boss. Some say Hulk Hogan. Eric Bischoff was the boss. Craig Leathers worked under him. Annette Yoder worked under Craig. Wendy Turnbuckle worked under Annette. That was the hierarchy. And anytime shit which would roll downhill would roll into her lap, P. 
Pee Wee would just revel in it, laugh, laugh in her face, smile at her, you know, give her shit. You know, we talk about ribbing on the square. Uh -uh, He was serious about that. That's how much he didn't like Wendy Turnbuckle. It was kind of funny. I'm not mad at it. Roll tide on, uh, on Pee Wee for that. Yeah. Um, here's a fun one. Oh boy. <sighs> Terry wants to know, were there ever any concerns with Sting's appearance in the crow IP or was that worked out with the movie studios? That was, there was never any, uh, that was one of those things where, uh, again, it's uh, better to ask forgiveness than ask for permission. Um, no, they just went with it and we never heard anything about the, from the people. Uh, Paul wants to know, do you agree with the NWO being booked to win the main event? No, I I think Piper's team should have won it. Uh, Jason wants to know, is Sting the most overrated wrestler ever? He was very good, but he's certainly not top 10. Uh, No, he's not one of the most overrated wrestlers ever. Uh, Why would you say that when, if you go back and and, uh, rack this, uh, not rack this tape up, or watch this on the network, you see how much the fans were into his shit. How could he? How could fans be not be, be into his shit if he's not over? Like I just no. Joe wants. He's to, not the most overrated one ever. How do the wrestlers feel about having their joint copped while they're being press slammed? Uh, I'm sure a bunch of guys liked it. Uh, it depends on the size of the joint, don't you think? I mean, if you got a button on a fur coat, it probably wouldn't have mattered. But if you got a baby's arm holding an apple, you probably would uh, enjoy it. And it probably would be a good handle on one end to hang on to to make sure the person doesn't slip. I'm just freestyling here. You ever try to do chin-ups on one of those? No, 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 no. I've never been able to do a chin-up, ever. I don't have strong enough arms. James Hall wants to know, hey, Tony, how fucking great is Brian Hildebrand? One of the best ever. One of the best ever, and one of the uh, one of the real tragic stories of of pro wrestling. Uh, he was named the shooter. I named him that because <laughs> of that fan trying to get into the ring, and and uh, Brian Hildebrand just not would not let him in the ring. Yep. Peter has a question. We all want to know: Was Tony ever considered to be the NWO Sting? <laughs> no, because how could I do that and not be able to say it's Sting? behind the microphone josh wants to know is this the worst incarnation of the four horsemen ever yes as a reminder he's talking about jeff jarrett chris benoit steve mcmichael and rick flair because arn anderson's out injured right yes it is uh jay wants to know how much does a strap match with buff bagwell cost today uh it cost uh 199.95 for 60 minutes if you want to go to an hour and a half it'll cost you 300 dollars uh, that, that's what I've been told. I don't know that for sure, uh, but you can go to uh, what's that site again? Cowboy uh, Cowboys and Cowgirls. What is it? <laughs> Cowboysforangels.com. And don't forget, you've got three <laughs> weeks left to book Loki Big Hog himself to come over to your house, show you a little uh, button on a fur coat action. And don't worry, boys and girls, the tape machines are rolling. Let's go to the ring. Adam wants to know, did, did Tony have to help Lex oil up for his match? Uh, no, I did not have to help him oil up for his match because as you know, I was out on, the on the, uh, on the set during the entire one, but with all that oil, someone needed to help him in the areas that he probably could not reach. That's a jealous man. If I ever heard one, Hmm. Ken wants to know, is Tony a fan of gimmick matches? And if so, which one's his favorite? Well, it it depends on what you call a gimmick match. Uh, I always liked, I always liked the, uh, (laughs) the Indian strap match. Um, but I like the Indian strap match. Okay. Uh, I always liked it because. I remember Wahoo McDaniel in the Indian strap match. Uh, and when, and I liked the cage match. I really did. Uh, so those were the gimmick matches that I like. I, I didn't really like all the trash cans and, and all the tables and all that stuff and everything, because I thought that it was just too much, but I always liked the strap match. 
Uh, there was a gimmick match in the first star arcade, and I know we shouldn't talk about it because we're not going to be able to get to it. But the dog collar match between uh, Roddy Piper and Greg Valentine, great gimmick match. Russian chain match, great gimmick match. Uh, Judy Bagwell on the pole, <laughs> not a good gimmick match. Uh, there were some good and some bad. Perry Owens wants to know how hard was it to play it straight during the Dusty Rhodes Bobby Heenan commentary on the Public Enemy Harlem Heat match. It was it was difficult. It really was. I mean, I I I always thought I I did a, a a pretty good job of trying to stay focused and not laugh at those guys, but there was a lot of laughter going on uh, that you did not hear. Hypothetically speaking, what would Klondike Bill have thought about Dennis Rodman? That comes to us from Bad Money Slim. Hmm. Bad Money Slim. He probably would have liked him better in his uh, wedding dress. Booger wants to know, did anybody have a problem with Roddy flipping the bird during the end of the horseman team interview? Uh, sure they did, but what could you do? Right? Absolutely. And again, that's, that's what you get. If you, if you, if you bring people in or not in the business, that's what you get, right? They say never work with children or, or pets because you never know what you're going to get. Never work with people outside the business during a work because you never know what you're going to get. 187 writes, wasn't this the one that originally had a long haired Goldberg and John Tenta in kilts on team Piper, but then they switched to the horseman. Yeah. I remember, uh, I don't know if it was a long haired Goldberg, but I remember, I remember that John Tenta was going to be his, one of his partners in this, that we had heard about that. And why they switched it, I don't know. I, I think that's pretty good. Uh, that's pretty good memory there. Well, we're going to see what we can remember right here for you next week. Vote in our poll. It's on Twitter at WHW Monday. But while I've got you, I want to go ahead and remind you to set your calendars because two weeks from today, mark your calendars, boys and girls. On the 19th, we're covering Uncensored 1996. This is the ridiculous main event with Hulk Hogan and Randy Savage taking on every bad guy ever in a doomsday cage. It's uncensored 1996 on the 19th. And then our farewell show, of course, coming to you the following week, right after the Shivani wedding. Uh, I guess we should spill the beans here now, Tony. Uh, the Shivani wedding is finally going down um, the weekend of the 24th. Do I have that right? Yes. Saturday, March 24th. So our farewell episode, boys and girls, will be Monday, March 26th. Leave the memories alone. We're going to have a uh, spectacular show for you there. We're going to go out with a bang on the 26th. Uh, you can follow Tony Schiavone. He looks forward to blocking you on Twitter at Tony Schiavone 24. I am at Hey Hands Conrad. And I feel like we should mention right now because we haven't as of yet. There's still time to help fund the wedding. I'm sure you've got big plans for the uh, an extra special garter belt or some such silliness. Uh, LoisRules.com is where you can pick up the shirts. What's really moving these days over at LoisRules.com? Still, Tommy Young, Loki Big Hog is moving quite well as well. And we're getting some people in, and I think we're getting some return sales, which I certainly do appreciate. But I think what's happening is that guys are giving in to their girlfriend or their wives, and I'm seeing a lot of movement on the Lois Rules shirt. Isn't that something? Well, I'll tell you what something is, uh, recently at the Conradison, uh, someone came to bed wearing a cat bath t-shirt. Yikes. And I just thought maybe it was like the steel signal. <laughs> was it? Well, I'm not discussing that. I'm just, well, you, 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 you brought us to the edge of the cliff there, buddy. You might as well push us off. I guess what I'm saying is if you'd like to get some cat bath action going at your house or maybe have a our wrestling version of the bat signal go down. You should go to lowestrules.com and pick up a cat bath t-shirt. Yeah, I'll pass on that, but I would like for you to pick up that t-shirt. Yeah, why not? And and I think you need to pick up a shirt hard way or easy way. It's lowestrules.com. And uh, Tony, when I look at my clock, I can't help but think it's about that time. It's about that time, ladies and gentlemen, the first team coming to the ring, the Ultimo Dragon and Glacier. Here's their entrance music. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, mortal 
Kombat. Dun 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 dun. Glacial. Dun 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 dun. Ultimo Dragon. Dun 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 dun. And now making their way to the ring, their opponents in this tag team match. Here's Dave Silva and Matt Coon. American whales, American whales, American whales, American whales, Americans. We're out of time. See you next week on What Happened When Monday on the MLW Radio Network. The rule of MLW Radio never stops.